Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We, uh, you know, had a lot of dreams around here in the big city, and certainly one that's alive right now is that one day the real World Cup will come here, and we'll have soccer in Baltimore. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I went to the World Cup back in 2006. Any of you who followed my career, it's my 30th year on radio. We're going to be celebrating with 30 crab cakes in 30 days in August. But uh, you know of my obsession uh, with the World Cup in 1998 and 2002 and then going to Germany in six and not going to South African 10 and being very happy I didn't. And then comes 18 where, like, they don't even qualify. And now comes 21 where I have American authors writing books that say, what happened to the United States men's national team. And I don't know that I've done a segment in the last three or four years on soccer in any way with anyone. And I have pictures of like the team coach, uh, Samson kissing me during friendlies in 1994 when they're playing Ecuador at Memorial stadium. Steve Mandis has written a book um, talking about the failures and the path to relevance or lack thereof, certainly in the aftermath of 2002 and the promise that was there. When I was a younger man, Steve Mandis, welcome in. Congratulations on getting the book and congratulations on an interesting life as well. I've done a little research on you. You're more than just a soccer author, but uh, for now, we'll just start with that. Thanks for making your path into our journey here. What's going on? Thank you for having me. Well, it's been exciting with the book and uh, getting all the reaction. Well, let's go to this because like, this isn't what you do. You're not Grant Wall, who we've had on the program, who does this sort of for a living and has done it forever. Um, I, I always ask when anybody writes a book, uh, you have to come at it honest because no one's doing it to get rich. And if they're already rich, they're doing it to make a point or tell a story. Uh, I've written a couple of books. I know what it, it takes to do this. Your fascination with the men's U.S. team. Let's start with that background, because it is one of those things that despite my old school jersey that you recognized, pretty fringe dude i've done sports radio here and i founded the sports station here in the 90s even when i did it and threw 3 a.m parties to beat mexico back in 02 it was good times good times back there until germany showed up um you know i remember these great great memories but they're a lifetime ago and i don't see much of this like swagging around anymore yeah and i i think that's one of the things we investigated so in 2002, in 1994, the, the fans in the United States really identified with the team. So if you, if you take, for example, the, probably one of the, the biggest names, Alexi Lalas, people were like, hey, that's somebody I would have a beer with. You know, if he wasn't playing in the, on the field, he'd be up here with me drinking some beers and, and being a knucklehead. His face would probably be painted. And people identified with that. And they identified Even if it only came every four years, like the Olympics, to some degree. I mean, again, yeah. I've done sports radio for 30 years. There are times when we really could talk a lot of soccer here and a lot of people were watching it and, and not traditional people, not people that may have played it in high school, or played it in college. Right. They come around the way we all came around Mary Lou Retton. And we're going to come around Simone Biles and like, you know, it, it, it's fun. And I've had crowded bars and great disappointments, especially, you know, when the African teams get involved, you know, over the course of time. But, but I remember it being spectacular and I don't know what, if that's coming back, right? Like, I, I guess we should, all should wonder, right? Yeah. And that's, I think that was one of the things that got away from that identity. So what happened was what we discovered is, is that Europe or this idea of Europe started to influence the thinking of the team. So we needed to to be more European, play more European, act more European. And by doing that, we lost our identity of being underdogs and being grit. We also lost our style of being counterattack. And so that's why I think you've seen like a little bit of dampening, not just the fact they didn't qualify. But many people just don't identify with the team. I think that's now gonna change when America sees this new crop of players because they're socially active. But this, this whole summer, uh, and fall in the qualifying will be our first chance to really get to know them because they're playing in Europe. Well, let's go back to, you know, my background in this and talk about 94 and like, I didn't play soccer. My last name's Aparicio. We had a different sport around here. Um, so baseball and the Orioles and my background with Camden Yards, not having the, the Ravens here at that time. Uh, I was doing a show out at the Sheridan and Towson and the entire U.S. team was staying in the hotel. So this team was... 
it was a friendly. They're playing Ecuador. It was Samson. It was Tab Ramos. It was uh, Precky. You know, I'm just trying to think of the guys I actually have pictures with, right, at that time. And then that sort of brought me into what they were doing in Chicago and building the team and John Harks. And obviously the whole Bruce Arena period of time was thought to be – a complete renaissance for the sport in America, uh, really in, 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 uh, in, on this continent, quite frankly, with what Mexico would do every time they would come and play in the Rose Bowl or play anywhere in this country, quite frankly, that we started scheduling their games in East Bejesus, hoping that you know no one from my side of the world, Venezuela, would we play baseball in my country. <laughs> they play soccer next door in Colombia. Um, oh, Brazil, they play okay too. But I, I would just say for all of my lifetime, this promise – that everybody's going to be into soccer at some point. I would have bet on that 20 years ago. Like, and I bought a radio station and I would have said, man, we're going to have a team here. The U S is going to be a big deal. We're going to be in the final. We're going to be a world power in soccer. Cause we're too arrogant to not be, we want to win. You know, we want to be great. And Look, I got a bunch of people here trying to bring one of these games here or maybe bring training here or stage teams here. I would love all of that. I mean, Baltimore has such a rich, incredible soccer history. Call Pete Karinji, you know, Kevin Healy, Ed Hale, indoor soccer, Stan Stamagri. Really? I mean, like, you know, I, I, love, I love soccer in that way, but I didn't grow up with it. It's not in my blood in that way. But the U.S. team was something I always wanted to have be fun for me because it was so much fun. And now I'm like, who's the coach? Who's on the team? You know what I mean? There's definitely that going on. Uh, and they have a long way back because it's it's tough to fight through all that. The NHL is trying to figure that out. The NFL, baseball, they're all trying to figure this out, right? Right. Yeah, I think Baltimore because Baltimore is such a great sports town. It's it's amazing. Um, but the you know what happened in 2002, the United States had something very unique which was, it was building off of the 19, what happened in 1994. In 1994, the way it was portrayed in the media was a bunch of college kids who were going up against these professional players. That followed after the 1980 Olympic hockey team. And then professional sports, professional athletes could now play in the Olympics in the late. Well, the cup being here in 94 touched people to like, oh, that thing used to be on satellite from Italy back, you know, or Mexico City. Like, you know, people would know who Maradona was, but not really. I mean, yeah. I was a big sports fan. I mean, so big enough that I've dedicated my whole life to it. In the mid 80s, Maradona came on satellite and on Sports Illustrated every four years with a blue jersey. And like, and it was like nice that he was crazy and drunk and all that. But that wasn't. Magic Johnson was going on here. You know what I mean? Right. Michael yeah. Jordan, Joe Montana, Cal Ripley. We had things happening here. We were taking steroids and hitting baseballs, you know? That's what we were doing <laughs> but, here. But right? in 1994, it was a magical summer in the sense that people really did rally around this team. They wanted to see if they could be have a miracle on grass as a like they had a miracle on, on ice. And so that momentum got lost. Maybe it was recaptured in 2002 a little bit. It was also, in, in my opinion, recaptured in 2010. In 2010, when Landon Donovan scored that goal, if you if you watch the video of, of Landon Donovan doing that and they and people captured the bars, someone put a video together of the reaction to that goal, it's had five or six million views uh, of just that one, of just people celebrating, not the goal itself. So it does tell you that that was there, but then there was a drop off. And that, and so soccer was picking up momentum. Now let's think about well, the 18th thing's an embarrassment, like, right. Like it's, and it's worth four years later, still talking about it literally. Yeah. So I, I think that there, and, and once again, it wasn't a talent thing. The United States had more talent. If you divide it by the number of players in MLS and the number of players in the top five leagues. So that's why we started to investigate and say, well, it wasn't a talent issue. We didn't qualify because we didn't have enough talent. We didn't qualify because of something else. And we say it's really more of a cultural thing or a lack of identity and a lack of style. Steve Mandis is our guest. Uh, he has written a book, What Happened to the United States Men's National Team? Uh, we're talking about relevance in soccer. And uh, I mean, your background's in business, man. You have a whole like, life before writing soccer books and all that stuff, but you've written a couple now. Give me a little background for you and your, your fascination with soccer and the money behind soccer and the business behind soccer, which uh, is uh, your forte if anybody reads your Wikipedia. 
Uh, I was uh, fascinated by it because um, the Real Madrid management team had read a book that I had written called What Happened to Goldman Sachs. And they read it and said, wow, we, and they, they really enjoyed it. I didn't know about this. And the reason they were focused on it was, is they said they were becoming more large, they were becoming larger, more global and more complex. And they were worried about the impact that would have on their fans and their culture. And that's what the book's really about of what happened to Goldman as they got larger and more global, more complex. So they knew, read the book. I met them by pure coincidence. And they're like, oh, we know who you are. We read your book about Goldman Sachs. And then we became friends. And then they, I didn't know anything about soccer. But you're a sports fan, right? Sports I mean, fan, but I wasn't a soccer. I didn't follow European soccer. Like I didn't know Real Madrid. I knew David Beckham played at Real Madrid, but I didn't know anything about it. You know, his wife was in a band. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. I probably knew his <laughs> wife better than I knew <laughs> So true. Um, so uh, I just thought it was fascinating how they managed the club and ran the club. And there were a lot of questions about organizations. Like, for example, you may not know this, in baseball, because I'm a baseball guy, you can never have too much talent in baseball. The sure. reason is, is because you have a pitcher, which dominates a large portion of the game, and you have a batter that does not need teammates in order to score. A batter can hit a home run by himself. Okay. In soccer, that's impossible. So a, a goalie doesn't make a stop, right? Or a player, does, a defensive player does not get the ball in, the, in their, all the way where their penalty area is and take it by himself and dribble, unless you're Diego Maradona, maybe go all the way down and shoot and score a goal. You need teammates. So actually the more talent, at some point you have so much talent that you diminish your actual results because the players won't pass each other or work together. To well, we've seen that with the Maryland Tarps basketball program. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, <laughs> you can know, see the richness of talent. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it is, I mean, I've been watching team sports forever, right? Like in, and the winners are when it comes together and it's, it, it's right. very rarely uh, not the sum of the parts and, and very rarely do the Yan if the Yankees would win every year, right? Or right, the Dodgers would win every year. That's the way it would work, right? Yeah, and so that's one of the things is people always think it's just money and talent, and and you've been in this for a long time. You, you realize that there's a lot of teams with a lot of money and a lot of talent, and they just don't win. Um, and there's teams that that maybe they don't even win, but they're really competitive, and that's because they have the right culture. They know how to to communicate to their players. So actually, Billy Bean uh, helped read a draft of my Real Madrid book helped me with it and gave me the endorsement quote for it. And, and when I met with him, he said, you know, the, the, the story you should really be focused on is not Moneyball and the A's, is the St. Louis Cardinals. So I went to St. Louis, and I don't know if you know this, but they actually give their players, when they, when they sign a player, they give them a handbook of 83 pages. Their coaches, they give a 103-page book. And they're like, memorize this book. This is our Bible. So it tells them everything from how to act when they walk into the into the, the state Cardinals way, right? Yeah, the Literally. Cardinals way. Yeah. All the rules. So it even says things like what you're supposed to do on the field. If you're on first base, there's two outs and two strikes or not. Situational. Allowed. Yeah, situational, Man, yeah. situational in life, whatever. So then because of that, they have a culture that eliminates the noise because everybody knows what the rules are. And everyone has to follow. Well, the military them. operates that way, right? Yeah. And when players leave and Albert Pujols may be a perfect example of this, and you're now in an environment in which players are getting certain advantages or they get, you know, they have better contracts and there's different rules for star players and stuff like that. You, you then have all these other issues that come into, into effect. So by having those rules, they did that. Real Madrid is run in a similar way. All the players' contracts are exactly the same. So David Beckham was like, hey, do I get box seats? They're like, yeah, if you buy them, here's the number. <laughs> so it's like, what? And he's like, and uh, if you want, and all the lockers are exactly the same size in numerical order. So I was interested in how they ran that as an organization to be successful and the St. Louis Cardinals run their organization to be successful, which is focusing on culture. Which I thought, that's why I was fascinated. By Steve, it. it's amazing. You know, I, when I wrote, I wrote a book on the Ravens championship with Harbaugh and I wrote one 20 years earlier, 12 years earlier with Billick on the first championship. But the second book for me was such a management book because the Ravens are the Ravens because of all of these decisions and the Aussie news, the, 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 the management decisions that these teams make and the men's soccer team isn't managed that way. Soccer isn't managed that way. And, you know, I, I don't want to go too deep into the rabbit hole with all this, but the FIFA corruption and all around it and playing games in Qatar when it's 120 degrees and then the U.S. getting a bid. And 
I mean, the whole thing makes college basketball look like it's not greasy, right? I mean, like the the, the whole premise of it. I know the Olympics are under some, you know, certainly some very, uh, you know, some salt a- a- after what's happened over the last 20 years where baseball fields were built in Athens and in Brazil, things were bulldozed and stuff. But the state of soccer is a global sport. It's such a huge industry. I mean, even here in America, where friends of mine are watching EPL now and NBC's got the games on every Saturday morning, like Wimbledon's going on, but it's soccer every Saturday morning um, that it's catching on with the same, you know, it's, Nietzsche, I guess you'd say at this point in America to be whatever it is, but behind all of this is whatever powers this is some greaseball living in Trump Tower in New York with parrots and birds scamming millions of dollars and then seeing these stories that come out after his death of like what goes on that that, that stands behind this shield um, that powers the engine of all of this over at least most of our lifetime, right? Yeah, so soccer has really become, as you said, it's become a huge sport uh, economically. It's a, it's just if you look at the top players in terms of their compensation, uh, I think most of the top ten or twenty athletes in the world are soccer players. I mean, Cristiano Ronaldo is the most followed person in social media in the world. Um, and then you look at these clubs. I mean, if you add up the aggregate value of the top ten clubs. Um, of soccer clubs there I, I i and you find their real true price uh they're going to be more than than north america jerry jones just thinks he's big i mean I, <laughs> literally right i mean when we're talking about what these teams mean i've traveled the world i mean i you know i know what manchester yeah. united means right? exactly and and so i think that's you know you you, you said it exactly right you, if you're the head of the dallas cowboys and you, you go to the middle of uh china and you say you own the cowboys sure you may get some reaction but sounds like a nice club team grid. <laughs> you're gonna get a big reaction for sure playing dallas uh, or fort worth uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> steve manis is here talking soccer no i i'd love for you to talk about fifa a little bit because you investigate chicanery and you know talking about golden sacks and it breaking down there's some chicanery going on there as well uh but certainly everything that powers and he's either fortified or punished u.s soccer uh you know whether it's hotel rooms where the alarms go off at three in the morning in Costa Rica, you know, whatever stuff that happens, it's pretty filthy behind all of it. And certainly the FIFA engine and everything that went on with the raid over in, in Switzerland a number of years ago, you know, it doesn't feel on the up and up at that level either. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't really study all of that, but I also think that uh, when you look in sports, just generally, there's just a lot of things that are, let's what we would say is unusual i don't think it's just uh soccer um and i and i and i don't think that the fifa is the only place that's had issues so but the men's soccer program is not funded in that sort of way or where we are in the sort of way that brazil looks at it or i mean being in these places how important it is there i don't know that it ever feels like really important here. This, this is actually something that we uh, study, which is because people are like, oh, so the United States could never be great in um, in soccer because we're not a soccer country. What we discovered is actually the World Cup isn't a competition of nations. It's a competition of zip codes. Um, it's a competition of zip codes, families, and immigration. So what do I mean by that? Well, most of the players actually come from very few places. So if you look at France, which just won the last World Cup, the majority of the players are immigrants or the sons of immigrants that live in these poor immigrant suburbs outside of Paris and Lyon. That's the majority of their team. Okay, and, and then what happens is they get identified and they've got brought to a national academy called Clairefontaine, and then many of them play at PSG. If you look at Germany, most of the players come from two states in Germany, and seven of their starting 11 players came from two development academies. Well, that's just the Freddie Adu model, right? From a million years ago. And so this is the this is the misperception, I think, in the United States is that they, they have these great soccer countries and they develop. It's actually not. It's zip codes. And then many times, as I said, there's some family connection to the sport or emphasis in their community for the sport. So take so we we reversed it also and looked at basketball. Basketball is not one of the top three sports in Spain, but they're incredibly competitive in basketball. 
and and so we're like so it's not just because we're not very it's a, a nationwide enthusiasm of soccer here it doesn't say we can't be very good in soccer it's just that we have to be very good in soccer in certain zip codes where there's an mls team or a culture or community that that really identifies with soccer so if you look back the teams that you really enjoyed three of the starters ramos uh, uh tab ramos for example he came from um carney new jersey three starters came from one town that just shows you why because their dads all played semi-pro ball they went and they played street soccer it was like an informal it's what they did after school as they hung out and their dads and their families and their community thought it was really important and that's what it takes to win and so now in the states well, we had a hell of a community here in columbia with desmond armstrong and rob ryerson i mean we had players of that ill coming out yeah. of programs in the suburbs here in the seventies and eighties in Columbia, Maryland. Um, and, and, you know, I taught, again, I've spent a whole lifetime doing this. So yeah. talking to these people and Pete Karinji getting UMBC into the final four a couple of years ago, this has been a sweet spot in that way. Yep. For soccer. Maryland soccer is incredible. University of Maryland's uh, soccer sure. program is amazing. So this is another thing which we, we said is, is that we found that college soccer is incredibly important to, to the development. And people said, why? No one's playing college soccer and then playing on the national team. And we said, what are you talking about? Christian Pulisic, Josh Sargent, Gio Rena, uh, Michael Bradley, they're, they're all products of college soccer. And they said, but they didn't play college. We said, yeah, but their parents did. So if you look at Christian Pulisic, both parents played college soccer. His dad becomes a coach. It's very important to their family. I called soccer games when his dad was kicking the ball for the Harrisburg Heat down the street in the indoor, like for years. You <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, I, I didn't know how to pronounce it. Pulisic, Pulisic. You know, we, we did it either way on the radio <laughs> for years. You know, I still haven't never met him or the kid or any of that. But I mean, you talk about legends coming from right. an indoor soccer player's kid. I'm sure he was sitting in the stands watching dad play when, you know, exactly. well, they, the bring him to, they bring him to practice and they play. So you see that in the NBA and a lot of other professional sports. Well, baseball, sure. The Griffey's baseball, all the way wrong. Because sure. they understand the culture. They learn how it works. They see what's important, et cetera. So the United States actually needs more time of that development, um, which is one of the things that it's a disadvantage. But over time, that will that will happen. So at one of our one of our recommendations is, is what we need to do is encourage more soccer more people to play college soccer and more of them to get married and have babies together. That's one of the recommendations. Well, you know, I don't, I don't know if they breed like that in China. I, I don't know, but I mean, I, you know, I know there is drug testing for all that. Uh, Steve Mandis is here. The book is What Happened to the United States Men's Soccer Team. Uh, you can find that anywhere books are sold. Uh, and uh, I guess last thought for you, or, you know, what have we learned here or whatever, um, their disappearance, and the embarrassment and all of that, the shake up, and this will really wake them up and we'll come back better and stronger. Get, make that case for me. Well, in the United States talent of the top five, defined by the top five leagues, the number of players we have in them, peaked in 2010. We had 12 players playing something like 23,000 minutes. It has been in decline since. So even with all these great players that we have today that people recognize, Christian Pulisic, Weston McKinney, um, all these players, uh, Josh Sargent, th they were last year, there were eight players playing in the top five leagues, eight or nine players playing fewer minutes. The, the big thing is, is the average age is 21 for those players, where in 2010, it was 29. So, so you're giving me hope on 26. Not just so, that we get, we qualify because like we're hosting it, um, right. but like, you know, actually playing two weeks into it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I so you, you will see that um, those who host the World Cup, the only country that has not moved advanced to the round of 16 was South Africa in 2010. Otherwise, every country has has moved on to the round of 16 knockout right so you know, I, hope I hope i have the problem of discussing group of death here soon you know because it's you know i love hearing the group of death uh steve mandis is here go go buy the book and uh, and read up on the u.s man you know they, these things are becoming relics right like this is now yeah. 20 years still fits still fits still trim <laughs> still breathes really well has a nice little lining inside of it it's very nice very well made for the soccer player i'm even growing some uh, like italian soccer hair so this is my covid hair I, I I feel very at home in the soccer jersey for having never played soccer. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, good luck with the book, man, and uh, congratulations <laughs> on all your success on life's journey and uh, the, the book on Goldman Sachs. Any uh, new projects? Anything you're working on? Anything uh, of note? Well, we're just rooting for the U.S. soccer team. 
That's it? All right. Well, maybe you'll be there to write the book in 26 when they win the World Cup. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know where would that be. Probably MetLife, I guess, or probably the new spaceship they have out in L.A. But um, a whole – hey, look, man, after we've been through the last year and a half – Lock me down for the month of June. Let me watch soccer for a whole month, beginning at breakfast. I'm a very happy camper. I need a World Cup right around now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, Steve. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. Bye. Steve Mann is joining us here. What happened to the United States men's soccer team? The book is uh, now available. Talking about the recent failures in the path to relevance, uh, you can find the book. And it's uh, Mandis, M-A-N-D-I-S. I am Nestor. That's N-E-S-T-O-R. Another one of our wise conversations in the books. You can find us at WNST and at AM 1570 and BaltimorePositive.com.